Hey y'all, hello, 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 welcome. Uh, we'll get started in just a few minutes. We're just gonna give time for everyone to get into the webinar and then we'll kick it off. I think we have everybody in and there's not anyone in the waiting room. So um, I'll just get us started because I think this is gonna be a really dope conversation and it'll probably be really robust and so we probably shouldn't you know waste much time um good evening it's good to see some familiar faces also really good to see new faces i'm amika i'm the membership director at law for black lives i'm really hyped to have uh this conversation tonight I do want to um, just go through a few housekeeping things before we kick off um, the webinar. Um, these days and times, I'm sure many of us have been on Zoom calls and Zoom meetings and webinars, so everyone knows how important it is to keep yourself muted. Even the tiniest noise, something that you think is very low, could actually really be amplified in the microphone and it will cut off the speakers. Um, we're recording this webinar for folks who can't make it um, and it'll be up on our website. So we want it to be um, a clear recording and something that um, everyone can hear and learn from. If you don't know where the mute button is, for those of you who are new to this, it is in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. If you're joining us via the web, there's a little microphone in the bottom left-hand corner. If you press it, it will mute you, you will know you're muted because the little microphone will show red and have a slash through it. If you're on the phone, you are automatically muted. And um, when we get to the question and answer portion, if you need to unmute yourself, you can press star six. Um, there are a hundred or more people on the webinar. So when we get to the, um, question and answer portion, which will be at the end of the webinar. Um, we will take live questions, but I will ask that you use the raise my hand function in um, Zoom so that I can see once you press that, I can see that you have your hand raised and I'll just call on you and then you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, it would be really great if you could keep your question relatively brief um, and ask one question so we can get in as many questions as as we can in the 10 or so minutes that we have. Also, I invite anyone and everyone on the webinar to use the chat box. So if something resonates with you, feel free to say that in the chat box. If you have questions that you don't want to ask on um, camera, you don't want to go off mute to do it, I will also look in the chat box for questions during the question and answer. So you can drop your questions there and I'm happy to ask them for you. Um, when you are asking your question also, if you wanna answer from a particular panelist, you will need to say that um, in your question. But other than that, um, I hope everybody enjoys. I hope it's a, a really good discussion. And so yeah, we're gonna get started. Um, just to frame this discussion, I do want to just say that this is a, a discussion about abolition, but it is also a discussion about defunding the police in the context of abolition. And, and we know that defund the police, um, defund the police has, is really a demand that um, has gained popularity after the police killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Tony McDade. But I think, it's also a response to what has become painfully clear to us about our collective safety and how elected officials and our government really are not interested in the things that keep us safe and they continue to put money into police and surveillance and cages when in fact there are other things that we need right now to be well and to be safe, particularly as um, a global health pandemic ravages our communities and um, the death toll continues to climb. Um, I think it's really become clear, but I also do um, think that folks who consider themselves to be abolitionists, who study abolition, who are working to see it realized, understand that um, defunding the police is like one demand inside of a larger framework and construct um, that we 
um, as those of us who call ourselves abolitionists or who are working towards that want to see um, realized. And so today we're gonna talk about that. And we're also gonna talk a little bit about how lawyers, those who consider themselves to be radical or movement lawyers can really um, find a way to plug into local defund the police campaigns. We have a really dynamic um, panel today, so I'm gonna kick it to them to introduce themselves. And um, if you could give us your name, your pronouns, where you're calling from, and any organizational um, affiliations that you'd like to share, that would be a great way to start. Uh, Tracy, we can't hear you. Hmm. I think we can hear you now. I can I can go in the meantime. Okay, that works. That's what happens when you show up to the webinar with the fire earrings. All the focus becomes about the earrings and not about abolition, Tracy. Um, my name is Derek. My pronouns are she, her, hers. What was the uh, the other two things? Um, they're all running together with each webinar. <laughs> no worries. Where you're calling from and any organizations that you want to rep. Sure. So I am currently calling from Baltimore, Maryland. I want to rep Law for Black Lives. I can't believe that Law for Black Lives is like a full organization now. When I was in law school, I was on the founding steering committee. So just to see it blossom and actually have members and people call in is just it has just changed so much in the last like five or six years um i also always try to shout out action st louis and dream defenders which ironically are the the closest thing that i have to political homes right now since i just moved but those are the groups that i do the most support with and then the movement for black lives um anyone else i want to shout out i think that's it i think that's it thank you Okay, I'm better now. Yeah. Um, so my name is Tracy Quarter. I'm calling from Oakland. She, her. Um, I am uh, the campaign coordinator on policing with uh, Action Center on Race and the Economy, or ACRE. Um, and I guess I can rep because I aged out of BYP 100. <laughs> but that's still squat. Thank you. I'm uh, Tyler Wooden. Can y'all gonna hear me well? All right, good, good. Tyler Wittenberg calling out of, out of Durham, um, Chief Counsel for the Justice Systems Reform at Southern Coalition for Social Justice. Um, definitely want to rep uh, Law for Black Lives as well, current Law for Black Lives fellow, as well as uh, bold Black organizing for le leadership and dignity. Awesome, thank you. Um, so I do, I want to start by asking the panelists to um, just kind of give us a definition or at least like an, an overview of abolition and what it means to you. And Tracy, would you start for us? Sure. Um, so I feel First, I want to say I'm really honored to be here because I think that for me, abolition has been something I grew into. Um, and I want to always like say that because I don't want people to think you have to be born an abolitionist. Like this is something I've learned. Um, I've been saying for a really long time that um, any anybody, any cop with a conscience should quit their job. Um, and that's why I quit being a social worker. <laughs> so uh, for me, abolition just really means the absence of harmful systems um, and us building something that we haven't seen in the place of it. Um, so it's for me, it's simple, even though it's like a really difficult construct, it's, it's just the absence of these harmful systems. I think for me, abolition is we good to go. For me, abolition is is both a, a compass and a destination. Um, something that we can use to assess ourselves and our work. Where, uh, as far as are we actually working towards uh, the world without all of these structures, these oppressive structures that have plagued us for so long? Is it um, 
it's something that we can use and the tool we can use to make sure that we aren't actually perpetuating the same things that, that have been instilled in us. And as a cis black man, I definitely need that check on a regular basis. So um, when we think about what black liberation is, what brown liberation is, what is the space where we all feel free to walk about in our own dignity without um, being scared to be caged, killed, choked? What does that feel like? What does that look like? I think uh, it, it provides us with the lens through which we can measure our own work to ensure that we get there and hold ourselves accountable to the things that are coming out of our mouths and, and to the work that we're doing with our people. Yeah, I share a lot of what Tracy and Tyler said. Um, I, I don't know if I would like define it, but I can just try to rearticulate what I've been hearing from you know, mostly black women who dec for like decades have studied and struggled with these side of politics, which is, you know, abolition, especially the prison industrial complex is an absence and a presence. So it's the absence of prisons, police, prosecutors. I, I don't know if there are any prosecutors on this call, but y'all too, y'all, all of you guys, yes, prosecutors as well. Um, the anything that benefits and profits from the Cajun and carceral um, state. And it's also a presence. And so it reduces the reason why people think they need police and present, police and prisons to solve harm, right? So it's, it's the reason, so it's expansive. Um, just actually like 15 minutes ago, I was on this um, Haymarket abolition webinar, this A to abolition webinar. And I was talking about Ruth Wilson Gilmore, who in December at this abolition conference in Mississippi, she said, you know, abolition is red, black, and green. It's anti-capitalist. It's for black liberation, it's internationalist, it's for the liberation of all oppressed people. And it, it involves climate justice. It, it, it's about how, well, how, do we, how are we relating to our planet differently to make sure that people, ha people, communities, institutions have what they need to thrive. And so when I think about abolition, I try to figure out, okay, like what audience does it make the most amount of sense to describe like those sets of things, but it's the destruction of the prison industrial complex and the reasons why people think they need it, which allows us entry into a broader expansive set of ideas and relationships for us to engage with each other. Thank you for that. And that I think brings me to a sort of bigger question. I'd love if you could dive a little deeper into this question because you all sort of touched on this a lot, but you all said like this is a this is a practice this is a like a study it's a place we're getting it's building it's taking away right why then um when people talk about abolition do they talk about prison industrial complex abolition right like why is that important to focus on why is that important to name um i'd love to hear um why you all think that that is is important So for me, it's important to name all of it because otherwise we'll just think it's one thing or another. And I say that because it was something that Derica actually said a while ago that really struck, struck me and has stuck with me. Uh, for so often, even when we call for justice for people who have been murdered by police, um, the justice that we're calling for is for them to be charged. And so when we talk about, it's important to talk about the whole system because it's important to realize that that's not what justice looks like either. Um, and so we can talk about this abolition of police, but then it's what happens next. Um, and so for me, it's also this idea that to not get sucked into the white supremacy that tells us that abolition on the other side would be, be perfection or to, would be utopia. Right? Like, that's like what we're sold. Everybody's like, well, if you abolish the police or if you abolish prisons, then what's next? And it's like, well, what's right now? Like, let's go toe for toe about like what's happening right now and why we need to get rid of this current system and why we're building something we've never seen. Everything about this system is enforced, whether it's in our entertainment, in the way we uh, discipline our children, in the way that we, even the idea we talk about it as discipline. All of these things reinforce this whole complex and this whole structure. So it's important for me to talk about the whole thing um, as abolition. I want to second that. Um, seeing things from, yes, exactly, as the whole thing. Um, and also, we, we know prison industrial complex being an extension of slavery and, and a, an extension of what existed before. If we don't name that, 
then what are we doing, right? We're, we're not actually chipping away at the, the actual ill that, that we're experiencing now that is being imposed upon us. Um, I also like the, the phrase or the, the, the concept of prison industrial complex because it means we're not just talking police, we're not just talking prisons, we're talking about all the ways people profit from them and all the different mechanisms that are used to control us. So from my context, uh, or at least from the work I do, you could say, all right, we'll get rid of police, but we're still kicking students out for random reasons. We're still um, shit, we're still having the, these constant instances of racism and oppression within the classroom, and even including segregating our own black youth from one another based on their reading level. We're still going into people's homes through through social workers or these other ways of mandatory reporting that then also add to the same system of criminalization and, and imprisonment. So if you don't name it all, then what is then you can't really paint a picture of the web that it is. Yeah, that word system is, is so important. You know, I've been, because everyone cares about abolition now for, for whatever reason, there's all these articles that's just like, what's the difference between police abolition and prison abolition? And it's, it's interesting how that conversation is emerging because people are being introduced to the concept, which is exciting. But I, I don't know if you guys follow like the Cut 50 campaigns. It was like, you know, we're going to cut the population, the prison population by half, by like 2050 or something. And when you hear that conversation, at least when I heard that conversation, it's just like, okay, well, what are we going to do with police? And people, it, it seemed like that wasn't even really being considered by most of the people who I was in conversation with. It's like, wow, we're going to cut prisons and, you know, by, by half, but we're going to keep 18,000 law enforcement agencies. We're going to keep 1 million cops. What are they going to be doing? If we're going to try to keep the prison population, we're just going to let all the cops just stay out here, which, you know, I'm so happy Miriam Kaba in her most recent New York Times article called for cutting police departments in half, right? Because it's just like, these things are so, so, so connected. So Tyler, when you say, you know, it's not just getting rid of the prisons and the cops, but also the carceral logic. So if we just, you know, disband the police, and then build another system that is beholden to capitalism, then we're also just going to be empowering them to use other kinds of violence um, and the mani manipulation and coercion to accomplish the same ends. And so, you know, the people who are thinking about the prison industrial complex around, I don't know, right before critical resistance were emerging, that term came from the military industrial complex. They were noticing that not only were the, the actual like course of apparatus, like not only the military or not only the prisons were emerging, but there was also all these people who were profiting from it. And it all must be abolished, right? So it's not, it's, that's why I really love when um, Ruth Wilson Gilmore says it must be anti-capitalist because not, it's not just like private prisons or like the, the, the phone companies, like the phone companies are making so much money uh, from prisons. It's like, yeah, that's absolutely true. But there's a larger community of people who are benefiting from managing inequality. Because if there were no police, we would just go take from the rich. Or at least I would go take from the rich. We, we would just go do that because, you, because no one should be able to accumulate that much wealth. And so there's a broader system that has to be undermined um, and without acknowledging that system. The same with the progressive prosecutor movement. It's just like, so wait, we're going to have a progressive part of the prison industrial complex? Like, help me, help me. You know, when I talk to people who are entering law school, they're just like, I want to go be a progressive prosecutor. And I was just like, if you want to become a cop, you can do that with way less debt. You don't have to go to law school in order to do that. There's so many other ways. Now, if you go to law school and you find yourself with a, a community who is interested in figuring out how to use the prosecutor's role to do harm reduction, that's different, right? That's, that's, that's different. I still have concerns about that, but that feels different than like dreaming of being a Larry Krasner, which is, well, Larry Krasner was a public defender for 30 years before he worked with the community to decide to go in. And even he has problems, right? So it's just, well, what are we dreaming about? How are we thinking of all these different parts of the same system? How are we undermining them and demanding resources to figure out other ways to be responsive to harm? This you make a good point in that, especially as interest in abolition grows in like more recent times, there are a lot of different takes on what 
this all looks like, right? And some of those land more in the realm of reform and some things are steps towards abolition, right? So I'm wondering, like, it's important to name what systems you're trying to undermine, but I think it's also important to distinguish between what reform is and what abolition is. So I'm wondering, especially from where each of you sit in the work that you do, like, why is it important to push towards abolition and not towards reform? And what is like one specific way that that shows up in your work? I, so I think if you if um, you say that my target is reform, you are inherently saying the system is okay. You 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 that's it. You're saying okay, it just needs a little tweak. You know, there's just something wrong with my engine. I just need to get the wire. You know, I'm not a mechanic. I don't know what it is, but you know, I you you're not saying that the car itself is trash, and that's that's where we're at right now. Um, and, and it's not trash for some. So some people want reform because they think the system is doing is working well. And I think those people are also invested in and support the oppression of black and brown people. So if you are against that and against the systems that do so, then you must, or and, and you want to be intentional about your efforts, then you need to work to dismantle those systems, abolish those systems, and build something new. Also, uh, abolition takes creativity and vulnerability and courage, reform takes, it, you know, it doesn't take any of that. Doesn't take creativity, doesn't take any imagination, doesn't take any vulnerability. It's, um, it's really a way to, to support a system uh, through, you know, through your own energy and effort, despite the fact that you, whether or not you believe it or not, you, you um, well, I'll just stop there. Yeah, I'll just stop there. Yeah, I think you got it. I, I want to also say that the current system that we have is a result of reform. So that we know it doesn't work. This is reform slave catching. It's reform using our bodies as capital. And so we know that we, I was going to swear, we know it doesn't work. It, it just doesn't. And so I think I, I remember when, and I folks, folks know that the eight can't wait thing came out and they were talking about, you know, seven, it would reduce whatever by maybe by 72%. And I said, well, I want you to look me in the face and tell me the 28% of our people that you're willing to leave behind with this. Like the 28% of our people dead or harmed can never be the real goal. So even if you're not there at abolition yet, you have to dig deeper than that. So the difference between like reform and abolition for me is like reform is set up to like make people who are privileged feel okay with the current system. So right now we see uprisings. Right now we see people all who are like, I gotta read this black book. I gotta Venmo my black friends. I gotta talk, follow these black people on Twitter. Like that's what we're seeing. And what, pe what they want is for it to go back to normal, to their normal, where they were comfortable, where they didn't have to think about this every day. And that's what reform does. And abolition says, actually every single day, you have to sit with the discomfort of the system that you've benefited from. And every single day we have to talk about the imagination, the creativity that comes with building something that we've never seen before. And we have to know and we have to allow us to stumble through it. Nothing has been perfect. And so we always, what frustrates me is when people act like the other side of abolition has to be perfect. And it doesn't, because this side of abolition isn't perfect. And so I constantly am pushing back against that. I'm constantly saying, okay, we, we've seen all of these reforms already in place. I shouldn't have to tell you to stop choking people. If I have to still tell you to stop choking people for you to stop choking people, then like you shouldn't be in whatever job you're in. So none of the reforms or the supposed reforms that we've seen will address the inherent white supremacy and capitalism that's in the system. And that's why reform doesn't work. Ooh, yes, yes. Yeah, I'm so happy. I'm like shifting. Um, it's been really hard for me to write. Like I, I've been, I've been feeling so overwhelmed with so much in the world and I've been like trying to figure out how to write and like respond and say what's in my heart, but I can't articulate it. And I finally started drafting something I think is really good. And I'm really proud of myself. And there's a quote that I have that y'all can't share because it's not out yet. And I know this is recorded, but like y'all just can't share it in the next couple of days. So I don't think it's going to get published the next week. 
but it's so fire. And to me, it captures like one difference between reform and abolition. This is from Naomi Mirakawa. She's a, um, a professor at Princeton University. And so she, she wrote to me, she said, at best, these reforms discourage certain techniques of killing, but they don't condemn the fact of police killing. Ban the chokehold, but allow murder with guns and tasers and police vans? The analogy here is to death penalty reformers who improve the noose with the electric chair, then improve the electric chair with chemical cocktails. But the technique of the murder doesn't comfort the dead, it comforts the executioners. I was like, wow, oh my God, yes, yes, Naomi, like that's it. She said that to me, y'all, so don't, don't quote that yet till it comes out. It's so fire because when I, even last week I was on this call with Dream Defenders and I was trying to like work through, like learn in public, like, okay, Derek, what's the most tangible way you can describe the difference between reform and abolition? And it's, for, for me, it's George Floyd living. It's the, it's, the, it's the cop putting his knee into, into George Floyd's back for seven and a half minutes instead of eight and him living and then he goes to get arrested and then he goes to jail. That's reform. That's the police reform conversation right now. It's for people like George Floyd to have near death experiences, right? So abolition acts why is why is a cop managing inequality? Why is a cop managing someone being used, um, being arrested for trying to use a counterfeit $20 bill? It's not trying to get him closer to live so he can go to jail. Like, that's not what I'm fighting for. I'm not fighting for him to be arrested and then be prosecuted and then be in prison. So when, even the, the justice and policing bill, again, which cops can just ignore the reforms as, as we've seen the president of the Chicago Union say that uh, I'm not going to let a stupid department policy like jeopardize my life. So this is, this is the president of the Chicago Police Union. So the, besides the point of the reforms can be ignored, the reforms don't really protect and invest in human life. And so are we fighting for near-death experiences? Or are we fighting for a society where people don't have to survive on counterfeit $20 bills? And that's the society. That's what I want to fight for. I want to fight. I want to be in that conversation, right? That, that, there's that. Um, the other thing that sort of helps me think through reform versus abolition is this other space called now reformist reforms, which comes out of socialism, right? It comes from Andre Gores, who is this socialist theorist who said, look, there are ways that we can undermine capitalism through non-reformist reforms. And what it does is take away, it undermines like capitalism, and, but it is not quite socialism, right? It's not, it doesn't quite put us in a place where the workers are you know, currently maintaining the mean, or owning the means of production. And the same is true for, you know, in the prison industrial complex abolition conversation. So there are non-reformist reforms like abolishing qualified immunity that doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily abolitionist, but it does make policing more vulnerable. It does undermine the protection surrounding the institution. And so sometimes we don't always have to choose like reform or abolition. It's like, well, what, how can we be moving towards abolition? Is what we're putting on the table undermining harm and undermining the institution? And then once we get to the abolitionist conversation, it's like, okay, well, are we also undermining the institution and coming up with alternatives to respond to harm and trying to figure out how to undermine capitalism and patriarchy and homophobia and ableism? Because all of those things must also be abolished in the world that we're trying to build, right? How do we move from undermining transphobia to move into trans affirmation. Like that's the abolitionist conversation. If you believe that the primary purpose and function of police is to manage inequality, like I do, to reform is to make them better managers of inequality. I don't wanna make them be better managers of inequality. I don't want them to politely move homeless people from one part of the city to another part of the city. I don't want homeless people. It's like, that's the reform conversation. So I don't want them to be better at their job. I don't want their job to exist. That's, that's so real. Um, I appreciate that. And then I really am starting to think about then in terms of the demand for defunding the police, do you think that this demand in whatever way you see it, is this a, 
a reformist demand or is defund the police an abolitionist demand or in what way is it an abolitionist demand? Like, how do you see it being that? I think for anybody who is trying to understand this demand in a real way, that's not trying to undermine it, understands it as an abolitionist demand. Um, I hear people say, I don't understand what defund means. I don't know what you mean when you say defund. Yes, you do. You absolutely know what I mean when I say defund. That's not a hard word. It means take money from. Like, it's not difficult. But people who want to undermine it start asking questions to, like, undermine what you're saying. So I think that it's really about this like ecosystem of organizing. And to Derricka's point, it's about not only undermining the system, but making sure that we're not undermining each other and undermining the movement. So like, if I'm saying, okay, let's just defund the police 50% and that's it, then like I am undermining the movement. But if I'm saying we're gonna defund this 50% so that we can show you that this is the, that what we all know that police don't keep us safe, we're gonna reinvest that money in community and let communities decide community safety, then that's talk, that's on the way to abolition. I want to give this story about I'm I live in Oakland, but I'm from Milwaukee, and so a couple of days ago there was um, a situation at a house um, near where I grew up, and folks had been calling the police, and they said that uh, there were young women being trafficked out of that home, um, and the police showed up and did nothing. And so finally, the community was fed up, and they went and got the girls out, and they burnt the house down. To me, that's safety. So the police showed up. And they undermined safety. The police showed up, used tear gas on people. Um, and then you could see people, because um, all of this was going down on like Facebook Live. People were like, don't burn the house, because then how will the police investigate? And I'm like, y'all, this is really deep. So the police did nothing to, to protect those girls. Even when I was a social worker, I could attend, attest to this. There were times where I would have to go pick up my girls from somewhere that I, my girls would be trafficked and I would know they would be trafficked and there was no one who would help and the police called them runaways. So imagine a 15 year old girl who's being trafficked by a grown man and they're like, well, she's just a runaway. So like, this is what we have seen police do. We know that they're not keeping us safe. We know community is gonna keep us safe and we need to invest in community. And so I don't want to Derek's point to make them better managers. It's just like if you send a bad manager to management training, they don't become better at their job. They become better at hiding from you how they're bad, bad at their job. And so when we're talking about reform versus abolition, we're talking about being able to like, also like, show folks that this is what we're, we're trying to do. We're having uh, a webinar about abolition right now. That's not where everybody is. I'm just getting my mama here. <laughs> like, and I'm talking about my little brother got out of jail yesterday. I'm very happy about it. I've been talking about it. Um, I'm bothering him. I'm FaceTiming him every day. He's very tired of me. But <laughs> um, even him being locked up for five years was not enough to make my mama an abolitionist. She didn't believe he needed to be in jail. She didn't, but she didn't understand the system. So this is something I had to work on her with. And so I, that's what I see defund the police as, is like showing folks what we've been talking about all along and showing people that this is not what safety is and this is how it works and making sure that folks know that it's defund on the way to abolition. Yeah, I can jump in really quickly. Um, so Tracy, I know that there is like, a subset of people who I actually don't think they are trying to undermine it. And I found out the hard way because has someone ever defended you and you don't want them to defend you and you just put you in an awkward position? You know what I'm talking about? So I was writing something on Instagram about defunding the police and someone was like, oh, like basically you're going to die. You don't know what defund is. This is ridiculous. It was just like kind of doing that in the comments. And someone was like, no, 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 it's okay. Defund the police means to defund them, to like rebuild them and make them like better and less racist. And I was like, ah, like, I know you're trying to defend me, but I, like, <laughs> so then you guys were like, I gotta delete the whole thread now because I don't have time. My baby upstairs is hungry. I don't want to fight on Instagram. It was just a lot happening. So I just deleted the thread. But yeah, I think that, um, there are some people who definitely want to undermine it. There are also some people who are finding it um, as an opportunity to like get money to like do their consulting work for policing. 
So they're just like, yeah, 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 Define. Look at Camden, New Jersey. They disbanded. Look at them now. Look at Newark. Look at Roz Baraka. He's kneeling with the cops. He's a black activist mayor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, we can, re we can rebuild. Look at Ferguson. When I was working on the consent decree in Ferguson, you know, the judge over the case was, she wanted to be the judge that made the consent decree work. Like, she wanted to believe in it so bad because it was like her her baby right so i think there are people who see it sort of as like job security it's like yeah like this is fun it's like breaking down the car and building it back up it's like we have a garage it's like that's sort of what it is and then, and then i think that without serious interventions it can be massaged it can be co-opted to mean other things than abolition Right. And I also just want to be honest, I think that without without people in our movement who are demanding to defund the police without doing that deep political education around, OK, like, you know, we're going to defund the police. We also want participatory budgeting because we don't want it to then just be refunded. Right. Or in addition to defunding the police, we want hiring freezes. We want to stop cop academies. We want to pass legislation that if you've been fired, you can't enter into private or public law enforcement again. So what's, what's the conversation that's like, that like we're, what sorts of interventions can we make that are clear and that are like on the table so it's, it, it, it can help prevent it from being co-opted. But I think the most exciting thing is that without people completely even knowing all the different possibilities and what it can mean, they're going to the streets and they're painting defund the police in yellow. And that energy, I think is the most important thing. I don't believe in the whole like from protest to policy. I think unfortunately, the people who ultimately end up creating the policy are four major civil rights legacy organizations that we probably can name right now. Um, so I, like, I, I'm not like particularly interested in like the protest of policy because the people who are, the, who should be deciding what policy is often are not even the people who are just, they're not the people protesting, let me say that. So, so let me say that, right? But I do think that the raw energy that's in the streets right now, the resistance, you know, 2014, I was like, yeah, we need body cameras, y'all. Like we need body cameras. And like right now people are like, defund the police. It's, I think it's incredibly exciting. So I think it can be an abolitionist step if we make it, if we, if we continue to demand that it be. I agree with that. Um, and also I think framing is important. Um, and simplicity, as much, we, you never want to be, uh, you never want to oversimplify something, but the demand of defund police, it, it, it speaks to something that automatically says we're not going to fund police. We're not going, we're not asking for any money for this. And I definitely think it's important to think about what comes after, but that framing piece, um, I think is, it, it allows everybody to get on board, uh, and folks to then ask questions, okay, defund and then what? So now you've got the conversation started. So I, I do appreciate that part of it. And I wanna point out two examples from the education context that are why we definitely have to have the conversation and figure out what those alternatives are in order for it to be abolitionist. When we think about uh, early on, the push to end out of school suspension led to in school suspension, right? So like, yeah, we're gonna stop doing one thing by sending them home, we're now we're just going to put them all in one room together and give them a packet. You didn't do anything, right? Because they didn't necessarily, that, like that, the real call wasn't to stop pushing kids out, it was to do something else. Another thing, uh, we look at, um, I'm, I'm saying in the youth context, diversion programs for youth. So instead of arresting them, we're going to put them in a diversion program where they have to admit guilt and charge them a fee, and they're probably going to fail the program, so then we just send them straight into the facility. Right, so you have to follow, that. we have to be uh, very intentional about how we follow up on the conversation, otherwise we just create another form of the same oppression. Tyler, that actually brings me to the next question, which is in your work, right? What, why do the people that you work with wanna defund the police? Like why is it critical or important to the work that you do and the people you work with? And since you, you brought it to like youth and schools, if you could just start by telling us like, why is defunding the police important in schools? I'm not sure that, I'm not sure what um, 
what people know about how police got into schools and what it looks like for police to be in our schools, but it would be really good if you could just sort of like explain that for us and explain why it's important um, for defunding, like to defund the police in the context of youth and schools. Absolutely. And so uh, the policing of students in schools is, is inextricably linked to uh, suppressing student movement suppressing the, the civil rights uh, demands of black and brown students early on uh, in, in what, you know, what we now call the civil rights movement. So it's not necessarily tied to Columbine. I want folks to know that. It is tied to putting black and brown bodies in cages and getting them out of the streets to fight back against uh, the same system we're fighting against now. It's important for us to talk about defunding police because schools have never had what they needed. Black and brown schools have never had what they needed to truly create a nurturing environment, an environment where we, we are safe with ourselves and can determine safety for ourselves. I'm going to go back to the car metaphor, right? We talk about failing schools um, and how, uh, you know, the schools are overrun with crime and yada, yada, uh, and then so we need more police in them. They are literally, so that if uh, we can use the car as a metaphor, uh, they're, they're not putting gas in the car, then the car is breaking down and they're blaming, right? They're blaming the driver. Uh, so we, we need to get to a point where we know, where we can name the invest. We already at the point where we we know what investments we need in schools to create safety, and they never gave it to us. We've always asked for them, but as soon as there's a school shooting, they have millions and millions and millions of dollars uh, to to put police in schools. So what the defund movement has done for police in schools, I think you should just ask Oakland. You should ask San Francisco. You should ask Seattle. You should ask Denver, you should ask Portland, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Milwaukee, East Lansing, Rochester, and hopefully Madison, Wisconsin, hopefully Wake and Durham County. Um, you know, I'm just saying, like it's, we, we have been planning for this moment, we've been organizing for this moment and working for it for a long time. Folks have put, uh, you know, the boots to the ground and we've been calling for police-free schools. And now this wave of energy has really given, uh, given the opportunity for it to come through. So for us, it, it means a lot. But we don't want these school boards to just be reactive and say, all right, we're going to get police out of schools, but then not invest. We don't want this to turn into that same analogy I used before with OSS to ISS. We don't want to, to, not, not, to now have uh, security guards and non-law enforcement putting choke holes on our, on our children and throwing them in a room, right? We want to use this opportunity to say defund, take them out and fund and put, uh, put in restorative practices, right? Put in more, more health professionals, put in community members who actually have relationships with you. And if it gets to a situation that needs de-escalation, to be there to de-escalate. So what, what we're asking for, and I think, and I don't want to go too, too large of a rant because now I'm in my bag, um, is, is uh, I think schools can be, uh, schools can really be this kind of laboratory for abolition. Youth are not burdened by the same experiences that many folks have. You talk to older folks about abolition, and they say, well, I'm with you, but I'm not. But I can't imagine that space without police. You talk to youth for five minutes, they, they, they imagine it now. They're already there. And so I think schools can be a space where we can, uh, tr through trial and error, through whatever we need, create these environments that then can be extrapolated to other communities. And, and we can learn lessons in schools and police-free spaces that can be taken uh, to, to other contexts so that we can actually, you know, spread this this this, this beautiful vision of abolition. Now I'm, I'm, I'm gonna chill out now. <laughs> Thank I, you, Tyler. I, yeah. I, just, I wanted to add on to a little bit about police-free schools, which is um, there's a group uh, in Milwaukee, Leaders Igniting Transformation or LIT, um, who just won their demand on police-free schools. And I remember working with them about two years ago. And um, like I, I came in and I was like, okay, y'all, what do y'all want? Let's dream together. And they were like, we want to like reduce like suspensions by 15%. I'm like, no, 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 no. That's absolutely not what you want. What do you want? And part of it is because like adults have given them this restriction on what is possible. And so I appreciate the space of youth organizing, pushing back on grown people saying you can't do that because they constantly prove that they can do that. And what, I, and what I'm also seeing from them is them saying, yeah, we won this thing and now this is not done. And now we're going to continue to do that. 
And so, you know, I think not only are schools the model, I think that young people's organizing with grown people outside of the way um, is the model for, for, for what abolition can look like. So I just wanted to add that because I was really inspired by I'm spitting. Yeah, yeah, for real. But Tracy, this is actually a good time then for you to answer the question for us. Why are the folks that you work with and on behalf of, why are they interested in defunding the police? What does that mean to your work? Yeah. So for, for Acre, a lot of the work that we do are, is around Wall Street accountability um, and budgeting. Um, I was really intimidated when I first came on. I was like, I'm not really a researcher. Do you, like, give me some books to read before I come on here because I've been here for about a month. Um, but the way we're looking at policing is really around um, moral and just budgets. And so a lot of the work I done, had done before was around invest divest. Um, and a lot of people saw invest divest as like this one to one. So if I divest like a million, a hundred million dollars from police, that means that we need to invest a million, a hundred million dollars into cities. And for us, we're actually like, no, we need to figure out how much money a city needs. So if a city needs $200 million to get all the things that we say we need to keep, keep, uh, keep us safe, then we need to figure out where to get that $200 million from. So a hundred million of it can come from policing, but then the other hundred, the other hundred million comes from tax and rich people. And it comes from cutting, uh, uh, contracts with people who are doing things like surveillance and um, facial recognition. And it's kind of like what we call 21st century policing. So it's not to like limit us into just like looking at a divestment, but it's about where else are we getting this money from? Because it's there. The feds can literally print money. We've seen them literally print money. And so how are we using our city budgets to say, Safety is these things. This is how much funding that we need. And it's the absence of policing. So we need this money and we need these police out the way. Um, and so that's why people are really interested in abolition. And I'm really proud that um, as an organization, we've stood up and said um, that it's not, because I, I think for a lot of people, not everybody, like divest, invest was like a really easy way to hide being an abolitionist. Like you were like, no, 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 no. I don't want to abolish the police. I just want to defund. I want to divest, invest. Um, and, I, and I think that even I, you know, three years ago, maybe fell into that trap. But now we're like out and proud. We're like, no, 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 no. We're going to defund the police. We're going to abolish the police. And we're going to replace it with these systems that we, you know, taking money out of everywhere else, these rich people, whatever. We're going to own these means of production. Um, and then we're going to be free. So that's why it's important for us. Word. Thank you for that. Yeah, this is this is hard because not everybody I work with is on board with defunding the police. You know, a lot of them are still very curious. You know, a lot of the so there are so I think of like organizations like Dream Defenders, who is very excited about this moment. Um, a lot of the organizations like BYP 100, Dream Defenders, a lot of the like ones that you know we probably see as a part of like new abolitionist vanguard, we're not always abolitionists. Like they became abolitionists. A lot of these groups started to get people arrested, to get George Zimmerman arrested, to get cops arrested. So it's been phenomenal watching them being politicized. You know, BYP 100 became an abolitionist organization. Dream Defenders became an abolitionist organization. And so right now, you know, I'm thinking about one of the groups I work with in St. Louis um, and, and Ferguson. I've been talking to some of the members and they've been having some tension between the divest invest framework the reimagine and public safety framework. And now there's the like abolition or defund conversation. It's just like, you know, part of it honestly is what what's the phil philanthropic catchphrase we can use to like sneak in our, right? Like what Tracy just said, how can we hide our abolitionist politics to get funding to do the work? Part of it is philosophical and just being like, well, what's the difference between defunding the police and reimagining public safety? Because right now there are people who are on board with reimagining public safety, but now defunding the police sounds like austerity or it sounds like, what are we gonna do? Like, what are black people gonna do in this community with, when they already don't feel, or not even, it's not subjective, when they already don't have lots of resources in those communities. And so then you have people who are like excited because this is a moment where they're being politicized and our members are being politicized towards this broader conversation. And so it's, yeah, I don't want to like romanticize how some groups are really struggling with this moment because they're excited that the conversation is happening. 
they feel some level of revival by a new uprising. It's unfortunate someone had to be murdered for it to happen, right? But they there is there's a sense of revival and just seeing everything almost I mean, Tywin ran off a list, but like now the Dixie chicks are just the chicks. Like who it it, it really feels like everything is changing. Like some ca- character is not big mouth on Netflix anymore. It's just like the things that you don't even think have anything to do with like police are now on the table. And I think people are very, very excited about that, but I still think they're trying to work through, you know, what does this look like? And in St. Louis, you know, there's been, you know, several, you know, black led uprisings before Ferguson, you know, there's a history of like radical interesting organizing that's happened there, which is like, you know, I'm so grateful that, you know, organizations like Access St. Louis and RC Defenders that are keeping that legacy alive. But there are other formations who are really grappling with this moment. And so I saw someone in the chat ask, you know, how do we basically get Black people on, on board? Where is it? How do we convince Black folks that this is the right path? I'm Black. <laughs> Thank you for, for letting me know <laughs> that... <laughs> That you were black. That I think that's in, that could that's important information. I guess. Um, yeah, it's hard. It's it's hard, and it's not not all black people are the same. There's some black people who are not on board because they are protected by police. There's some black people who are not on board because they're afraid of violence. They're afraid of violence from their neighbors, their partners, their lovers, their children, their parents. And if you take police as an option without helping them or working with them or investing in other options, it feels like they're losing the one thing that can have even if they're not effective. And so it's, it's deep political education, it's deep study and struggle, it's patience, it's grace, it's curiosity, it's listening, it's not romanticizing one sect as the community, right? It, it takes a lot, it's not like a, a one size like fits all to like, how do we get black people on board, right? So we have to really think about and try everything where I've you know been really, really inspired to know that it's not from scratch. Right. There are lots of people who've been practicing and experimenting with abolitionist responses to harm in black communities and poor communities and immigrant communities literally for decades, probably for centuries, to be honest. But at our fingertips, the people who've been organizing around this are alive right now. They've written about it. They are in organizations. I had a conversation with Barbara Ransby the other day and she said, you know, I'm not a retired organizer. I'm an organizer right now. Beth Ritchie, that, these, these people are organizing right now. So it takes a lot of imagination, will, and commitment to political education to learn what people are doing and to be in conversation with them to see, okay, what does it make sense for me to try to replicate? What does it make sense for me to try to experiment differently? And how can I work with other people who are a part of it? And the last thing I said, I'll say because it just came up and I was thinking about it anyway, um, is that it's hard when black and brown communities look to become law enforcement as a way of social mobility. Lori Lightfoot said this in a New York Times article of the day, and it just drove me up the wall. She said, when people think about defunding the police, they don't understand that they're harming black and brown officers who can only enter the middle class through this way. Okay, so if the only way that black and brown people can enter to the middle class of Chicago is by being violent towards other black and brown people. Are you sure you want to protect that, sis? Then y'all closed down like 30 schools a couple of years ago? Like, I, I, I'm so, uh, it's just like, shouldn't we? So we have to keep policing because it's a jobs program? Because that's, that, that's the same logic for keeping prisons open. It's a jobs program. What are we going to do about the jobs? It's just like, so we have to, like, we, we have to stay beholden to a violent institution because it employs people? It's just like, come on, like we, we, I'm pretty sure that there are so many other ways that we can think about spending people's taxpayer dollars without it being mobility into the middle class, which is also why we need to abolish class and capitalism. But yes, it, yeah, so it's, it's, that. it's the same with the military. There's a poverty draft. I was in ROTC in high school. I thought I was going to go to the JAG and like be a, go to the Air Force Academy and be a lawyer in the military. Because guess what? I was sold on, this is how you leave your community. This is how you travel the world. This is how you pay for college. But if college was free, if they cancel student debt, 
if if Delta and United and Southwest and Southwest, which I love, I would do commercials for them. I love Southwest. Oh my gosh. But if these things were collectively owned, then we wouldn't have to like fight over who sits in the front of the plane on the back of the plane. So we can reorient society if we want people to have a better living. But since police are managers of inequality, we have to figure out how to protect them in their jobs, right? And so it's just, there. I'm sure there are other ways we can think about what to do um, in terms of the labor force. It doesn't re require people to be violent. That was a word. Thank you. <laughs> um, I do want to just like I, all of you said in some form that like when doing this work, there's like a like there's some creativity, there's some vision involved in what world you're fighting for, what world you want to see. Um, so I just want to invite you all to offer to us like if if not even just abolition, but if we just win on the demand of defunding the police in a way that is a step toward abolition. What do you think is possible? Like what is a thing that you see being possible if that happens, if the demand is met and folks are successful? I think, I mean, one of the things I think about is what's happening at Oakland um, where the folks who have been leading on this uh, work have called not only for divestment, but for um, what is a Black New Deal. And what I what is really possible for me um, right now in this moment, like we could do it today, is that police shouldn't be first responders. That there's absolutely no reason that police should be first responders for for anything, but for mental health crises or like the, there are models that exist, um, and so that's my dream for yesterday like quit letting police be first responders i think about uh this, um, i'm sorry i'm sorry i think about, I think about um, um, the the description that my father and my mother give about the school they went to ran by the community folks that they they had it, they knew. Um, the level of accountability and trust in one another. Of course, this was a forced situation, right? It was a forced situation, but there were elements of it that were just purely beautiful. And then he also will talk about what happened when they integrate. Now, I'm not preaching against, you know, I'm not preaching segregation, but I do envision a world where we care for one another. At a, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. But I. I do. Invest, but I. I would like to take some of those gems and have them exist in a public school today. I just finished today listening to students talk about um, the 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 fact that they hate being in the gifted class because they're the only black person in there. And then they walk out of the class and they're profiled by the police officer saying you ain't supposed to be on this hall, right? Then they go home and they make fun of another way. I want, I want to envision a world where we're checking in on one another, adults to children, where we're loving one another, creating nurturing environments for one another, and where people uh, trust and love one another enough to check on one another in, in both ways of are you okay and you need to chill out at the same time. I think grace, accountability, and love can live in the same house. I think they have to live in the same house. So that's, I think, a school building that, you know, I'm always going back to that, where grace, love, and accountability are living in that same school building, and we're all taking care of one another. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a little bit overwhelmed by the question. Like, there's, there's just so much that I want. Like, I want different problems. Like, I want to fight about different problems. Like, I, I don't, I... Like, I, it's annoying to keep talking about police and prisons. It, it's actually, I, I want to have different problems in society. I'm not even sure what those problems are because there's so many like problems you have to figure out now around like bills and violence and I mean like big picture. I just think about like, if there wasn't like homophobia or rape culture, like we could just have a like much better sex, like as a, as a society, like, that's what we can have. We, 
just imagine if you drink too much at a party, like your biggest consequence is like headaches. Like that's the society that we're fighting for. It's like sometimes it's just like, yeah, we could just have so much more in this world to like argue about, you know? And it's just, it's unfortunate that all of the inequality as a result of capitalism and racism, it's, yeah, it just, it overwhelms like our problems. It, it, it overwhelms our problems. And I don't know, I just want to fight about different things. I want to fight, and I know it's like a much longer term, like total project, even though I see examples of it now. You know, one of my friends, Felipe, he, every summer he does like a, a, a summer camp with boys around toxic masculinity and homophobia and transphobia. And it's just like, that's the work of abolition to me. Because if we want to stop violence, if we want to stop harm, we have to understand that police can't stop transphobia, they can't stop homophobia, they can't stop racism, right? So we have to create people who are not socialized around those harms. Because if we don't, if we're not intentional about that, society is, they're going to default to that, because that's the kind of society that we live in. So I always am excited about people who are undermining the root causes of violence and like pushing people like out of those, you know, out of those systems and out of those ways, out of that way of thinking. So yeah, I, I, there's just so much that I want, like so much that I want. I was reading Grace and James Lee, um, Grace Lee and James Box. And it was the first time I read like, like critiques of unions from like the left. I'm used to like reading critiques of union as like a right to work thing, but you know, Jimmy was just like, man, the most people thought that they could get was like a 40 day, a 40 hour work week. And it's just like what capitalists ultimately did was take, you know, 60 hours worth of labor and force people to do it in five days and eight hours. And I was just like, wow, like here I am knowing like, or at least learning the history of like labor struggles for what you know, people didn't want to continue to be exploited. But he just said, you know, there could have been, there were so many opportunities in the labor struggle for a much more transformational shift where there were these opportunities to not run the factories, you know, in, in two and three week periods, but actually like move towards a socialist revolution. And we just missed those opportunities because we didn't dream that big. It was just, how can we just have like, you know, a shorter work day, a shorter work week? And it's like, it's, it's interesting. It's back to the reform conversation. So yeah, I just want people to dream as big as, like, as possible. You know, like it, that's, I just think that's what we deserve. And it, it can sound like a little utopian and a little airy, airy but it's, it's kind of what I want. And people have been dreaming about that for a long time. So when I see people wear like, I'm my ancestors' wildest dreams t-shirts, I just be like, come on, guys. Like, your ancestors probably had a lot of dreams. I, I don't I don't know if this counts. Like, let's just slow it down on just romanticizing our ancestors. Some ancestors, their wildest dreams was like a really nice hot bath. Others was like, you probably don't even know because you don't, you haven't even read that history, but the t-shirt is cool. And that's a cool t-shirt. So I just want us to dream as big as we can and then believe that the world that we want is already in the making. Just to start making those steps. Thank you. Um, I'm going to bring us to a much less um, broad question, one that's probably a little boring, but we do have a webinar full of lawyers um, who are probably thinking, okay, so what do I do? Like, how do I plug in um, to local defund the police fights? Like, how do I um, use my skills, whatever those skills are, um, to further the efforts of movement and seeing this demand um, met. And so I'm wondering if all three of you could offer one or two ways that you see, like just generally, or that you know from work that you're doing, that lawyers can be useful to movement in this moment. Mm hmm mm hmm Um, really quick. Um, so I think Derek has said this, like one of the things that's really, ex really exciting is there are people who have never thought about abolition before who are getting politicized in the moment. Um, and so people are out and they're saying defund the police or they're making demands and they don't know like where to plug those demands into. Uh, because the system is designed to be confusing and harmful and all the things. Um, so one thing that could be really helpful is helping organizers 
who are making these demands, figure out where those demands fit. Um, and if those demands are like possible within the current system. Um, there are folks who have showed me like, okay, you're asking for something and that ain't even, ain't even was, was over here. You gotta go over here for that. Um, and that is invaluable. Um, for, for organizers. So I think that that, and then just finding out where the local protests are, and if you have time going down to help, because we've seen police, um, I like to say this is what police are like on their best behavior when they know they're on camera, um, and it's still wild. Um, and so being able to be there um, on the ground, if you're able, is also um, something that people can do directly. I think um, yeah, it depends on your particular skill set. I know uh, so there's there's people who know labor law, right? And if we're dealing with defund police, we have to deal with police unions, right? We have to deal with teachers unions, right? So I think late, late, and then it's uh, to your point, there's people that know budget, there's people that know specific city policy, whatever your area of expertise is. I think um, you can offer that to the to the right group that's in your area. Um, and be helpful, I think, and not coming in with an attitude of, oh, I want to help and feel like I helped. I think mean, that's, that's one thing that, that's harmful, to come in and be like, oh, that's all you need me for? If, if, if you needed to, to, to paint the street, if you needed to put stickers on a damn poster board, I don't care, like, just, just help out and be present and, and continuously show up. I think showing up is that big piece and taking, uh, lead, taking direction. Uh, from the, the grassroots leadership on the ground. And even as an attorney of color, I still myself take leadership from organizers on the ground who are doing the work. So I think it's that, that level of humility, as well as knowing what your skill sets are and being willing to, to offer that uh, in an earnest way is very important. Yeah, so I used to work with Tyler at Advancement Project. And if I was still working there, I would never say what I'm about to say. But if you work for the LDF or ACLU, tell your employer to give money to Black organizations. LDF and ACLU get obscene amount of donations. Anytime there's an uprising, anytime Trump does his shit, that's always like ACLU and LDF are unfortunately like the go-to like hubs for like people who don't really know about the criminal legal system and just like oh yeah like donate 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 ej i even got like tens of millions of dollars i've heard from the protest i'm like do they even do policing work and so please if you work for one of these large establishment organizations i get i've gotten like three emails in the last couple of weeks of people who are like like afraid to like say something and it's just like, hey, Derek, I work for this organization. You know, like we got so much money because of the uprising. And like what we're putting out does not match what's in the streets. If you work in one of those organizations and you have already got your two or three people that you meet up with outside because you're scared to talk inside the office about the office culture, those two or three people that you meet up with, y'all need to have a serious conversation to push your organization to give money, to redistribute that, to give, to do something, but to not sit on millions and millions and millions of dollars that has come as a result of young black people hitting the streets. Y'all just gotta give that money up. Y'all gotta run those coins, as my little sister said. Y'all have to run those coins. I, it, it's not, it's not, it's unethical at this point. It's unethical and people are so afraid to speak out against it because it's, we understand the history of those, of those organizations. We understand what they have meant for early iterations of those movements, but it's, it's at this point, we can't have organize, organizers you know, who are like not getting money or have tiny budgets to do all this labor for these other larger organizations to benefit from it. It's, it's not fair and it's unethical. So that's like what. Um, the second thing I would say is to do political education. It's not, I don't think it's enough to be, to have an expertise in like your legal field. And I don't think it's enough for you to read Angela Davis by yourself. So I think that you should probably join other people, maybe the same people who you be talking shit about your job. That 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 sounds like a good person. I like that person. You y'all should be friends after work. Create small study groups. Read. Struggle through this work. Try to figure it out. Like 
like develop an analysis because your analysis if you decide to no longer be a lawyer if you decide to get a pro if you get a promotion or move to a different you know organization your analysis is going to continue to be sharp and you're not it's not going to be subject to the whims of your your um, strategic plan every six months so you have to get an analysis the last thing i think i'll say is um <sighs> All right, I know lawyers really like the Constitution. Like, it's it's something that I had to like fight up against a lot, especially with against the DOJ, who just was so adamant about constitutional policing and this, you know, this um, what Trump did is unconstitutional. I understand. I understand the Constitution is the supreme legal document of the United States. I understand it's important. We need people to like betray the constitution like and not and not like in a way that's unethical and not in a way that's going to get your client like in trouble or unhoused or without like not in that way but like we need lawyers to kind of like talk shit about the constitution because people love lawyers so much and whenever we give the constitution legitimacy it, it like it reifies the system that we're in that's that's violent right so it's like well how can we start being honest about the Constitution, even though a lot of what we do depend on, on what it says? I, I understand that. I understand that. But at the same time, it's like, well, hopefully, if we're serious about this work, we have to start rethinking, like, is that the document that we want to keep? Right? You know, when Paul Butler says that most of the police violence that we see is completely constitutional, that matters. And we're like, we're sworn to protect that thing as lawyers. And so it's just so unfortunate that I, I know a lot of lawyers who are afraid, who do all they can, you know, turn themselves into pretzels to try to make constitutional arguments. But we know damn well, like, that's not what the founders was thinking. And it's unfortunate to, like, have to admit that because that's also what Republicans or conservatives say. But at some point, we have to, like, break this constitutional bubble and, and yeah, dream bigger, think bigger than the Constitution and, like, really you know, see ourselves as, as betraying the legal profession, which is to mostly maintain power. And that's not something that's going to happen overnight, but it's something that we have to start being honest about if we're going to be movement lawyers, if we're going to be social justice lawyers. We can't keep, we can't stay beholden to this very, very, very bad document. That's the most I've said constitution in like a year and a half, but I've been <laughs> every word I said. I can feel it. I can feel that you meant that. Um, okay, so we're going to open it up to questions for about 10 minutes. And we, I think we had a hand raised. Let me just find it. One second, y'all. Uh, Rachel Schultz, you have your hand raised. Would you like to ask your question? Hi, yeah, thanks. Um, this is for Tracy Corder. Um, I'm a social worker and I <laughs> um, was really, um, I've been feeling a lot of, I think what you referred to about like discomfort with the field and my role um, in connection with the police and also just like in connection with kind of the institution of social work. Could you say a little bit more on your thoughts and how you decided to move away from that and kind of alternatives? Yeah. That's yes, um, thank you for that question. It's It was a journey, um, but I, uh, so a lot of the work I was doing was in court with young people. Um, and so I would go with them. I had clients and I pretty much lived at children's court um and i would see like just like the really arbitrary ways that the kids i worked with were like put in jail or not put in jail versus like other people um and some of it was because like i kind of bought into the respectability stuff so i kept ties in my car for my boys and i had stuff for my girls to wear into court and talk to them about the ways that they should sit up or talk to the judge and it really impacted it. And I said, I actually am reinforcing this system that's harmful. And me sitting with the family for like one hour a week doesn't actually change society for them. So I'm sitting in people's homes, which, you know, everybody thought like we had the right to be in people's houses. And for me, even as a brand new baby social worker, I thought it was a pleasure. I could not imagine 
when I was 15 or 16 years old, some random stranger coming up in my house and my mom being okay with it. So yeah. I understood and I took that responsibility really, really seriously. Um, and I, you know, I'd be at somebody's house and the lights would go out. What am I doing writing a care plan with you that's changing society so that your lights don't go out? Um, and so it's just really in, in having, to, like being a mandated reporter um, and having to call police or having to call social services on people for things that like didn't sit right with me or being around coworkers who didn't understand a family. And so they would like literally call the, call the police because somebody's house wasn't clean enough. Those are the kind of things that, um, you know, when you go into social work, I went in with this idea that I'm gonna save the world <laughs> um, and got humbled real quick. Probably day one, I got humbled. Um, and I just couldn't sit there. So it, after about a year of, of figuring out I couldn't sit there is when I decided to leave. And I left to run for office. Um, I ran for a county board in Wisconsin, in Milwaukee. Um, they were funding funding my job. And so I said, okay, if I can win this seat, then I can reform <laughs> the way um, this job is funded. And I can reform some of the laws that are put in place by this job. Um, so for me, it's really been about like, how do I impact policy and how do I um, change narratives um, for people um, to see that like the, being a social worker is not being the kind of world saver that we are taught that it is. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I had to leave. I couldn't, I couldn't sit there because the current system um, that we are fighting has social workers who are playing a role in it. Um, and I had to go. <laughs> That's, I can't be more coherent. I'm sorry. It's just all I, I all I know is I had to get up out of there. <laughs> Thank you, Tracy. I want to throw in this question from the chat um, before I take another hand. Um, it says, what advice do you guys have for youth who are new to activism and learning about this topic? Where can a person start? Where can a young person start? They didn't specify the panelists, so anyone who has an answer is well. I think, um, I think, uh, most major cities and even some of the smaller cities have youth organizing institutions. Um, so linking in with those who folks who are going to support youth and help politicize youth, develop them, teach them about organizing, and then even have their back as they graduate and move on throughout life is huge. Um, I've known so many organizers who started off in youth organizing. So I think if, if that exists in your area, then get active. If not, um, maybe even I can share my, con uh, you know, I could try to help out with that, try to figure out uh, who what's the closest uh, youth organizing group that you can get in contact with. But I think that's important and I'm happy to help with that. Tyler, can you drop your um, email in the chat for the person who asked the question? I don't have a name. Right. It came through private chat. I don't have a name, so I got to drop it to everybody. All right. Yeah, <laughs> use it responsibly. <laughs> um, okay, the next um, person who had a question was Justin Joseph. Sorry, I didn't have a question. I was just, uh, I, I think I hit the clap for something somebody said. <laughs> All right, <laughs> thank you. Uh, Katie Graham had the next question. Hey everyone, um, thank you so much for your time tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, something I had a question about was um, I've been trying to find abolitionist texts that um, address the prevention of paramilitary groups or the privatization of police by the wealthy to protect their property um, in a future where the police begin to get defunded. Um, so I was, this is a question for all the panelists. I was wondering if there is like a text about some policy that would address, um, you know, like if the police were to be defunded and then abolished, um, 
in the future if there's abolitionists who are writing about uh, the prevention of um, things like the Boogaloos or the KKK or other paramilitary groups, um, and if they're tackling um, the privatization of police that already exist or could exist further. Um, so that's all I have. Thank you. Um, I don't have any text, but it is something that I am working with folks to think about. Um, it is something I'm, I'm concerned about, frankly. I mean, this is what we've seen throughout history, um, that when power is uh, challenged uh, and taken, what we see is that like white supremacists will uh, show up to reinforce it. Um, so if I find anything, I can definitely like send it around, um, but it was just quiet. So I just wanted to say that that was something I have been thinking about with other people. Um, and also remembering, and I think the reason I want to jump in is like rem is remembering that it is going to be police officers who former police officers who are these white supremacists. Um, I was I, I'm really struck. I did a march from Charlottesville to D.C. after um, the kind of Unite the Right rally or whatever it was, um, and so the governor of the state of Virginia made made it so that state police had to be with us the whole time. And so between our stops, when, um, I was like one of the people who was like supporting with like ice and food and all the things. So I would see everything. Um, and so when the marchers were marching, people would be like yelling at them and like throwing things at them. Um, and then they would stop at like a rest stop where we set up food and water for them and they would leave. And I would see the very same people who were harassing our marchers, like chopping it up with police officers because those were their friends. And so remembering that, um, it's going to be deflected police officers who are going to be part of the problem. Um, so I, I, um, I can't think of any text that exists right now that is, you know, trying to preempt that, but that sentiment is an abolitionist scholarship. Like people who, I mean, it's, to, to be a police abolitionist, or it's also to have this broader critique of the military industrial complex and private security, it's to abolish the carceral logic, the logic of policing. So it's not like, oh yeah, okay, we're cool as long as police are private, right? It's, it's also hopefully to undermine private law enforcement, which is why it's, there's this broader critique of capitalism, because even private law enforcement manages capitalism like that's they manage inequality so it's it's hopefully working against both of those things at the same time um i went and got this book off my bookshelf because this is like my bible i love this book so much it really helped me sharpen my police analysis like it gives so much history about police and militarism and I think Kristen, he often talks about like militarized, we, well, he says society talks about militarized policing, but actually, if you look at the formation of the military, a lot of it is informed by police. So there's this, this relationship that works both ways, right? And so I thought that was just one of the most revelatory things I've read about policing, actually how much it influences our military and our militaristic presence in other parts of the world. So people have been thinking about the relationship between you said military, right? Not just private. I thought I heard military, paramilitary. Yes. And so I, the abolitionist project is also definitely criti like critical and, you know, concerned about um, private police. But if I think of some, some article in particular, I, I'll try to, I'll send it to um, a law for Black Lives and see if they can send it out. I think actually there may be something that came out on Truth Out or Boston Review in the last couple of days about policing and militarism. So I would check both of those websites out generally for their police stuff, but I, for like private, for private and militarism, I think I read, saw something in the last couple of days. We can post any resources with the webinar and we can always update as well. So they'll be listed under. So if you think of anything, um, send it our way, we'll post it. For everyone, we're going to take one last question because we are really out of time, um, which I know, sad face, this has been a really dope conversation. Um, but I will take Isabella Smith and then um, we will close out. Hi, um, 
You guys kind of talked about abolition in regard to the school system. And as a college student in a pretty conservative town and, you know, a non-Black ally, how can I kind of be part of that change as a student, I guess? Well, I love college students. Uh, I think you can, um, yeah, uh, there, what, hopefully there's some background there within organizing, right? I, th I think I've, I've had that question myself when I've been, you know, early on in my career, uh, and collegiately, I think, and it, but, and, you know, it, it didn't take long to find out that there were people who organized that were there, right? You, you, there's, there's already probably someone doing it. You're not by yourself. Uh, so try to find out those folks who are trying to organize against the police on campus. I know a lot of that work is going on in D.C. right now. Um, and, yeah, and campuses across the nation. Police-free schools isn't just a movement for K-12. through It's also for our university system where individuals like myself pulled over, gun pointed in my head, drug out the car because they thought I wasn't supposed to be on campus, right, uh, multiple times. So, um yeah, I, I would try to find some other allies to organize with and, and get to moving toward it. Um, it's kind of hard not knowing where you're at or, yeah, but. Oh, I'm in Kentucky. <laughs> uh, that, doesn't, that doesn't make it any easier. Oh, know, sorry. <laughs> where in Kentucky? I'm just... Bowling Green. Bowling Green, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that, like Tyler said, all across the country right now, there are student prison divestment campaigns. There are students who are interested in trying to get the universities to divest um, funds from, you know, private prisons and also in fossil fuels, right? There are, there are universities, students, universities at, not universities at students, students at universities who are pushing their institutions to sever contracts between police departments right, who are trying to disarm police who are on campus. And so I think it depends on what you're interested in in particular and to see whether there's already a campaign that's happening. If there's not, reaching out to other students who are doing those sort of divestment campaigns and figuring out whether there's people on your campus who would be interested in doing it too. And then also, even in conservative places, you can check and see whether there are people who are organizing a local community around similar issues you care about and then join and support those efforts. So I know like being in college and even when I was in law school, I did a lot of student organizing in law school and much more, I got, I did much more radical student organizing in law school than I did in undergrad. Um, and I was very, very fortunate that the, the law students who I met who, whose politics were just so much more like sharper than mine, like really like pushed me to think differently about the world. They were already making relationships and building, you know, solidarity and moving money from their student organizations to, to organizers in the Boston and Cambridge area. So I learned like from them, like, oh, I guess we should have been I really learned and appreciate that model of organizing the on campus, off campus. And there's a long history and tradition of that. All the way back to San Francisco State University when students took over the campus to start a Black Studies program. Right? So that there's a long history of on campus, off campus organizing. Um, but yeah, I would just see who's doing it, what you're interested in, develop an analysis and find your people. All right, y'all, we are one minute over. I wanna respect folks' time. Um, I just wanna close out by saying thank you to Tracy and Derica and Tyler for sharing your time and all of your brilliance